Come on. Is anybody ready for what God is going to do on tonight? Happy holidays to everybody joining us all over the world on tonight. Listen, this, this is what I would like to call just a necessary word. We, we're going to give you some salt on tonight. My goal is that when you finish listening to this word, you're going to be salty because <laughs> you are the salt of the world. I want to thank everybody just for your faithfulness, for your faithfulness week after week. And all of your comments, your emails, they are so encouraging. I promise you, it is my honor to serve you. And tonight I, I want to get to work um, because this is something that I think is really going to help somebody's perspective. So go ahead and tag somebody, tag us, let us know where you are in the world, tag a friend, and let's get to work on this beautiful Sunday night. Foundational text comes from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm going to read the same verse in two translations, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Somebody put in the room, cleanse. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, the exact same verse in the Message Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. With promises like this to pull us on. Dear friends, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit and holy temples for the worship of of God. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and everybody who has graced me to come in your living room, your vehicle, your headphones via podcast, there is and there seems to be a consistent verbiage between these passages of scripture. That there, there seems to be a congruent language in these passages of scriptures and that language is, let's cleanse ourselves. Let, let's make clean, let's make a clean break, be separate, perfecting in holiness, holy temples of God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's cleanse ourselves. Let us make a clean break, perfecting in holiness. Come out from among them and be separate, holy temples of God. Cleanse, separate, holiness. This is how I study. Cleanse, separate, Holiness, holiness, separate, cleanse. One more time, cleanse, separate, holiness. Holiness, separate, cleanse. What if these passage of scripture are revealing to us whenever God wants to assist us in our pursuit of holiness, whenever God wants to assist us as we rid our life from filth, However, and whenever God wants to assist us in being his holy temple, he will always separate us to cleanse us and prepare us. One more time. Please don't miss this. Whenever God wants to assist us in our pursuit of holiness, whenever God wants to assist us as we rid our life from filth, whenever God wants to assist us as we are becoming his holy temples, he will dedicate and design a season of your life where you are separated for the purpose of preparation and purification. 
all throughout the Bible. I can give you Bible all day. This is interwoven all throughout the fabric of scripture. Moses was separated and alone in the wilderness. This is just a moment. It's just a season. Joseph had a moment in his life when he was separated and alone in the prison. Elijah had a moment in his life when he was separated and alone at the brook. Jesus even had a moment when he was separated and alone in the wilderness. Biblical character after biblical character, biblical icon after biblical icon, we see in the passage of scripture that there is a moment in their life when they are separated and alone. One of God's methods to help cleanse us and to prepare us is by getting us to embrace a season of separation. I'm going to help somebody on tonight. He says, be holy for I am holy. The word holy in itself means to be separate. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to experience separation, to be separate from sin, to be separate from your appetite. I'm trying to separate your cravings that you have developed in Egypt. Egypt is symbolic of when we were slaves. And sometimes as God is assisting us to be purged and assisting us to separate appetites that we used to have in Egypt, you're going to start losing relationships that were formed in Egypt because watch this, Friends will always extend to you their diet. Why are we coming out like this? Friends will always extend to you their diet. I know we may not like this. I know we may not like this, and I believe it's because we have gotten conditioned to sugar-coated messages. So much so to where when you get a message that has salt on it, it tastes like judgment. I'm going to try to give you a word on tonight that has some salt on it. We immediately try to dismiss messages <laughs> that are salty, but you are the salt of the world. And please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not speaking of some self-worked righteousness, some self-worked righteousness, because the blood does wash us. You know that old school song that most of us have possibly heard, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of, y'all talk to me, put it in the room. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So don't misconstrue what I'm saying. The redemptive work that Jesus did on the cross by dying for our sins and shedding his blood has the power to wash us from our sin. So repentance and putting our faith in Jesus, that is how we experience the gift of salvation. I remember when I was a student pastor, I asked a question one Sunday as we were having a rap session. I said, how many of us in here are saved? Everybody hand went up. I said, okay, saved from what? Creek, 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 creek. Can we add a cricket sound effect? Let's add it. There it is. <laughs> how many of us are saved? I'm saved. Okay, from what? What are you saved from? Because I want you to have healthy apologetics, meaning being able to defend your faith. What are you saved from? You are saved from wrath. Jesus took on the full wrath of God on the cross. So you and I, once we live a life of repentance and put our faith in Jesus, we are no longer subjects of wrath because he paid the penalty for death. So I just want to get it clear. I want us to get it clear. I'm not talking about some self-worked righteousness. So God is like, okay, you, um, you asked me to come in your heart. I got you. All right. You, you, you asked me to save you. I got you. That's your salvation. Oh, but your transformation, that's going to happen by the renewing of your mind. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. You asked for me to come into your heart. That is your salvation. Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is your salvation. But your transformation, that's going to come by the renewing of your mind. Your transformation is going to come by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in your life. God, I hope y'all are getting this. The Holy Spirit, that's my helper. 
Can I get somebody to put in the room? I need help. He is not an it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Just like I am a father, I am a son, and I am a husband. Three different roles, one person. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. And I need us to get this. For many of us, we're like, okay, I asked Christ to come into my life. That's your salvation. But the Holy Spirit is like, I need to help you with your transformation. So I'm going to help you to stop watching porn. Yeah, that's my job. You have salvation, but I'm going to help you with your transformation. I'm going to help you to stop cursing people out. You have salvation, but I want to assist you in your transformation. I'm going to help you to heal from that trauma that you received from your ex. I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm going to help you with your transformation. Somebody say, that's my helper. Tag somebody. He is my helper. He is my helper. This is not about your salvation. The Holy Spirit's role is to help us. Yeah. Yeah. I know you love Jesus, but I'm going to help you to stop getting high. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you to stop using weed to escape some reality of the pain that you don't want to talk about. I'm going to help you heal from that. But what I need is your obedience, your surrender, and your intentionality. One more time. What I need, I need your obedience. I need your surrender and I need your intentionality. Listen, I need you to be intentional with seeking my face. I need for you to be intentional with getting the word in. Rather, if it's in person or if it's online like we're doing tonight, I need you to get the word in. This is just one hour, one hour. We started at six, we'll possibly be done by seven. This is just one hour. You know what one hour is? That's 4% of your day. 4% of your day, watch this, 4% of your day can make a 100% difference in your life. I need you to be intentional with seeking my face and intentional with prayer time and intentional, intentional with reading the scriptures because you cannot love God and not love his word. These are his love letters. These, these are his love letters. One of the ways, please hear me on tonight, one of the ways God assists us in our pursuit of holiness is to separate us. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Now, I want to give a little context. The clause, come out from among them, is a reference from Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verse 11, speaks of when the Israelites who were returning from exile in Egypt, the people of Israel were commanded to forsake any idolatrous way and habit that they may have picked up while they were in Egypt as they're returning to the promised land. And Paul, the author of Corinthians, he's using this same verbiage, come out from among them. So Paul is speaking to the believers at Corinth and he's saying, okay, I need us to understand Corinth, it is plunged in sexual immorality and idolatry. Come out from among those patterns and those habits because you have been called to be a billboard of heaven. So understand, yes, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but now I need you to understand there's some patterns in Corinth. Me here in Houston, there's some patterns that exist in the culture of Houston, down in the dirty, dirty, down here in the dirty South. There's a culture that I want to make sure that you are separated from that culture, from that pattern, from those habits, because you have a kingdom to represent. Please hear me. Please hear me. For transformation, there must be a season where you are cocooned. You are in a chrysalis, if you will. There, 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 there has to be a season. There has to be a season, not might. There has to be a season where you are cocooned because you have gotten too used to crawling. 
You have started dating crawlers. I'm talking to somebody. You have dated crawlers, been hanging with crawlers, eating with crawlers, sleeping, my God, sleeping with crawlers. But I need for you to trust me as I place you in a cocoon where I can give you wings because I need you to rise above this. And that's not going to happen unless you have a season of separation. It is a season of obscurity, a season where God strips away everything that you found comfort in outside of him. It happened to me. It happened to me. I'm in college, my freshman year, when I gave heaven my yes. When I gave heaven my yes, freshman year of college, I used to say the first thing that happened in my life, but everybody else is different. But in my life, when I gave God my yes, the first thing that happened to me, I used to say I lost friends. <laughs> now I say I lost people who were strengthening my Egypt appetite. That's so good, y'all. I, I didn't just lose friends. I lost people that were strengthening my lust. See, some of us, the people that you call friends, all they really are are people who are strengthening idolatrous behavior. All they are are people who are strengthening your desire for an addiction. I lost people who strengthened my Egypt appetite. So 19 years old, I found myself every day eating alone in the cafeteria. 10,000 students went to my college, found myself eating alone. Ever so often, my cousin would possibly join me for breakfast or my roommate or somebody who used my ID. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to do that, but I'm not going to preach to you a lie. They used my ID just so that they could have lunch and they would come and have lunch with me. But I found myself alone, alone in the cafeteria, alone in my car, alone in my dorm. But watch this, y'all. I was not lonely. I was in a cocoon. God was ridding me of a crawler type of behavior. I was in a cocoon. Now listen, this is just a moment. God's going to do it with you. He did it with me. I showed you biblical icon after biblical icon. It's not a lifelong sentence. It is just a moment. Now, the reason this separation moment seems longer for others is because you're not embracing. You're not embracing the stuff that God is trying to strip away that you got comfortable with while you were crawling. Now, I've researched this. Caterpillars, when they're in a chrysalis, sometimes they die. And the reason they die is because there was a there was a bacteria or there was a virus that was also in the caterpillar. It was also in the chrysalis as it was transitioning. And I believe God is trying to put somebody under the sound of my voice or you are there right now. You are in a cocoon season, a chrysalis season, if you will. And you, you're in it longer than you have to be because you don't want to rid yourself of the bacteria. <sighs> You don't want to rid yourself of the bacteria. That could be a boyfriend who's a bacteria. That could be a girlfriend who's a bacteria. That could be a habit that's a bacteria. There's something that God has you here in this season of obscurity. And he's trying to deal with the bacteria. And he's trying to prepare you for where he's taking you. Or this season is lasting longer than it needs to because you keep on trying to negotiate with God. God, I, I'm not good enough to do that. God, no, no, nobody's going to listen to me if I do that. God, I'm not good enough to do that. God, I think you picked the wrong one. I need you to pick somebody else because I, I'm not good enough to be a pastor. I, I'm not good enough to write books. I, I'm not good enough. And so we find ourselves going back and forth with God, which is prolonging this season. But let me tell you something. God is not a good negotiator. <laughs> he's not a good negotiator. And then one person will say, yeah, but remember when God looked at Adam, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. You're right. 
But I want you to also take heed to that when God first made man, he could have made Adam and Eve together at the same time, but he didn't. He could have made Adam and Eve together at the same time, but no, the creation narrative shows us that God intentionally and deliberately created Adam first. You have to know me first, Adam. I have to give you an assignment first, Adam. Dress and keep the garden. Name all of the animals. So he's giving him an assignment. This is your purpose right now. Name all the creatures. That's a monkey. That's a toucan. That's a rooster. This is your job. So he spent time alone with God before there was ever Eve. Even with Adam, there was a moment in his life when he was alone. He was alone. He didn't even feel like he was lonely because he was so focused on the assignment that God gave him. What if, what if this passage of scripture is revealing to us the way that God assists us as we're pursuing holiness, the way that God helps us rid our life of filth, and the way God assists us to become his holy temples is he dedicates and designs a season of separation in your life. The season of separation is for us to be cleansed and to introduce us to our calling. Now, I want to explain what happens. What happens many times is the enemy gets us to mislabel the season of separation as loneliness. The enemy gets us to mislabel the season of separation as loneliness. But the cure for loneliness is not company, it's calling. This is why I'm doing this series. This is why I sweat out of my clothes every week. This is why I'm doing this particular series and message on tonight. Because this time of year, around the holidays, there are so many people who battle and they struggle with depression. They battle and they struggle with being alone. And I'm trying to get somebody to see, maybe we are mislabeling it. Last year when I did cuffing season, I ended it in November. And in December, I started a series called Dear 2020. Just 2020 was just that type of year. I'm like, we need to address what God was doing. What do you do when God puts your faith in the gym? You work out. But this year, I'm going all the way to the end of the year with this. Because around this time of the year, a lot of us forget just because it's the holiday season does not mean your season of separation is over. And I want us to have a biblical perspective. Somebody watching this message on tonight with tears swelling in your eyes. I want you to understand this feeling that you have. No earthly relationship can feel it. None. Let me put my foot on the gas and go a little deeper. Maybe the reason why you feel so empty is because God has emptied out everything in your life that we were using to try to replace him. Did y'all hear what I just said? I need my towel so I can't throw it. Maybe the reason you feel so empty on the inside is because God has emptied out everything in your life that we were using to try to replace him. And the only person that can fill this void is him. I want to speak around this thought. Can y'all believe all that was intro? Like say love for a second. All that was intro. I want to speak around this thought from this subject for a few more moments on tonight. And I'm going to get out of your way. Me, myself, and loneliness. Me, myself, and loneliness. Father God, you're awesome. Would you help us to shift in our perspective right now? Help us to understand that this is not a season of being punished so we're isolated, but this is a season where you're cleansing us, detoxing us, and introducing us to our calling. Help us to understand that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that you'll do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody put in the room, amen. Amen.
man, the reason you possibly feel so empty is because God has emptied everything out of your life that was trying to replace him, me, myself, and loneliness. This is going to help somebody on tonight, y'all. It's confession time. I need everybody to put this in the room in all caps. I felt this while I was just engaged in sermon prep. Confession time. Let's put this in the room, everybody. Father, empty me from everything in my life that has taken your place. I'm not alone. I'm being cleansed. I feel this, y'all, one more time. Father, everybody, everybody, put this in the room. Father, empty me from everything in my life that has taken your place. I'm not alone. I'm being cleansed. Cleansed, separate, holiness. Holiness, separate, cleansed. Could one of the methodologies of God be as he's assisting us in our pursuit of holiness is to separate us, to cleanse us so that we may be holy. This morning, I was reading a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Very familiar passage of scripture, but it just really was standing out to me that I said, I need to add this to this message on tonight. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, come to me, all who are wearied and bur burdened. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It was sticking with me this morning because I was like, it's, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, all of you who are tired, all of you who are tired, like physically, emotionally, mentally, even relationally, so exhausted to where you got to this place where you're like, okay, God, with all due respect, can you please give me my tracking number for what I prayed for? That's all I ask, God. I'm not asking for much. I'm just asking, can you please provide a brother? Can you please provide a sister with their tracking number for what I prayed for? And God, if you lost it, just say that. <laughs> just, just say that you lost the package. Just, just, just tell me. All of you, all of you who are pandemic exhausted, all of you who are exhausted with trying to perform, all of you who are exhausted by bills, all of you who are exhausted by loss, all of you who are exhausted by success, all of you who are exhausted by stress, come to me and you will find rest. It's like Jesus is saying, there is a fulfillment, there is a relief, there is a clarity that can only be found in me. So if you're tired of living in a fog, come to me because I'm the only one that could clear the haze. Let me separate you from that where I can give you clarity in this, but don't mislabel the season of separation as a season of loneliness. You are not alone because I'm trying to punish you and isolate you. This is for your transformation. Hear me. This is for your transformation. This is where you get your wings. Everything you prayed for, God, I want rest and, and God, I want understanding and, and, and God, I want clarity and, and God, I want peace. This is where I could calm the turbulent water of emotion that is churning in your soul. This is where I give you inward stillness, but I need you to know I'm not punishing you. I'm not punishing you for anything you did. This has nothing to do about what you did, but everything to do with what you must do. He said one more time. This has nothing to do with what you did, but it has everything to do with what you must do. I'm not punishing you, Moses. This is about what you must do. 
You have to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I'm not punishing you, Joseph. This is about what you must do. You must go tell Pharaoh and interpret his dream so that I could put you in a position not to just protect this nation, but, but to protect other nations and help your family. I'm not punishing you, Elijah. You're just tired. You're just tired. You need a break. So sit here at this brook, Cherith, and I'm going to give you some cake. <laughs> really happy. Just read your Bible. An angel came and actually gave him some cake. You tired, bruh. This place and this season in your life of being alone, it's not punishment for anything that you did. This is about everything that you must do. The season of separation is for introduction, detox, and revelation. Need everybody put this in the room. This is going to help you. You may not be, you may not feel lonely right now, but there might be a time when you do. And I firmly believe this is why every message you should listen to because God likes to give us, give us open book test. So if you ever hit a season when you battling with loneliness, you can come back to this message and you can understand the season of separation is for introduction, detox, and revelation. I have separated you because I want to introduce you to health. I want to introduce you to health on the inside, not just an appearance of health on social media, but compromise in secret because spiritual decay happens one compromise at a time. I want to give you health on the inside. This is why I beckon for you to fast and, and beckon for you to pray and, and, and beckon for you to listen to salt sermons. Last year, I used to say binge sermons. I'm not saying binge sermons anymore. We need to binge sound doctrine sermons, okay? Biblically accurate sermons, salty sermons, not sugar-coated sermons. I'm trying to get you in a place where if you can, serve somewhere. I understand that we're in a pandemic and some churches are still closed, but if there's a place that, that I could serve, maybe God will surround me with divine fountains instead of the enemy surrounding me with demonic dreams. Ugh. I'm, trying to put, I'm trying to give you health. The season of separation is so I could train you to invest in your spiritual evolution by the power of Jesus. And hear me, if I was a note taker, I'll write this down. Health is always an investment, never an expense. The pursuit of getting healthy, it is always an investment, never an expense. And one of the most powerful ethics that you and I could do as heaven's billboard is to present to our calling a healthy version of ourself versus an on fume version of ourself. I want you to be spiritually nourished. This is why I study the way I study and I preach the way I preach. I want you to be spiritually nourished. Here's the problem though. So many people care more about externally flourishing that they overlook the fact that their spirit is malnourished. You got cars, you, you, you have more notoriety than you ever had in your life, a bigger platform. You got to check on Instagram. You have all these people following you, your ministry, your business, your career. All these people know your name, but listen, you are spiritually malnourished. Your spirit man is saying, I'm starving. I'm not being fed. Obedience is not being followed. I need us to live a life of repentance. And what is repentance? Repentance is chopping down the tree of our rebellion and begging for God to pluck up the roots. I'm trying to give you health where you could be nourished. This is going to change somebody's life tonight. I'm trying to give you health. This season of separation is for introduction and revelation because revelation is the mother of clarity. Woo! Revelation is the mother of clarity. And when you don't have clarity, you risk going back to the very thing and the very places that broke you. Clarity, clarity. This season of separation is so that you can detox, okay? It's gonna be uncomfortable when you detox. You're gonna have withdrawals when you detox. The season of separation is so that you could detox, so that I can get for you to stop liking and craving what you had in Egypt. 
Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? Whenever a non-rehabilitated heart gets intimate with an Egypt appetite, they will always give birth to a child called relapse. I need to say that one more again. Not one more time, but one more again. Anytime a non-rehabilitated heart gets intimate with an Egypt appetite, they will always have a baby called relapse. And what I'm trying to do here on the earth, I can't afford to have any more public professors, but private inmates. The cure for loneliness, it's not company, it's calling. See, listen, you can be happy and alone, and you could be in the crowd and lonely. You could be single and happy and have joy, and you could be married and more lonely than you have ever been in your life because the cure for loneliness, I'm going to say it all throughout the message until you get it. The cure for loneliness is not company. It is calling. Loneliness, loneliness many times arrives at our heart when the reason of our birth has been undiscovered. This is why I'm so lonely. And so now we end up mislabeling the spirit's quest to awaken and discover why you have been born as loneliness. Loneliness shows up when a call has not been answered. This is so good, y'all. It shows up when a call has not been answered. And that, that lack of fulfillment, that static in your soul, it's the Holy Spirit's alarm blaring on the inside. I'm talking to somebody. It's the Holy Spirit blaring on the inside. The search for why God cosmically created you. And the alarm goes like this. Why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? And you can't shake it. You can't shake it. And you're trying to silence that. Why am I here with sex? And you're trying to silence that. Why am I here with alcohol? And you're trying to silence that. Why am I here with drugs? And it's not Fulfilling it. The cure for loneliness is not company. It is calling. Being alone and being lonely are not congruent. They're not the same thing. In fact, Jesus deliberately sought out time where he could be in solitude. I'm going to give you Bible. Look, I'm not just giving you opinions. We're giving you Bible. Look at this. Matthew chapter 14 um, verse 12, it says, then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Look at this, y'all. When Jesus heard it, he departed from, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place. Y'all are getting this, y'all. To a deserted place with his disciples, with his mama and them with his homies, a deserted place by himself. When the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. This is so powerful. He couldn't even stay in this place too long because his purpose immediately start calling him. He came for people. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to edify us. He came to separate us from the power of sin and death. The people wanted him to free them from Rome, but Jesus came to free us from sin. More Bible, Matthew, Luke chapter five, verse 15. However, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So loneliness is not the absence of people. Loneliness is not the absence of people, but rather it is the absence of gratitude. It is the, it is the absence of purpose, which is the absence of meaning. It is the absence of being thankful because gratitude and pity will never be romantically involved. Never. Gratitude and pity will never be romantically involved, involved. And then some of us have to understand maybe you're lonely because the Sabbath principle is being violated. 
You work, you work, you grind, you hustle, you work, you grind, you hustle, you work, you grind, you hustle, you hustle. On Memorial Day, you grind and Christmas Eve, you grind and you work, you hustle. And then something happens that just dramatically changes your life. Something like a pandemic happens and you're quarantined or something happens where you can't work for a while. And then that causes for loneliness to show up in your living room with a cup of coffee, look you square in the face and say, I'm still here, bruh. <laughs> What you thought you could outwork me? <laughs> you thought you could grind me away, hustle me away? No, that was just avoidance. That wasn't deliverance. I'm still here. I know many of us feel as though when I am alone, I'm lonely. But what I want you to see is Jesus sought out solitude. He sought out solitude to be refueled. Okay, so purpose requires for you to pour. So whenever I'm alone, it's rejuvenating. When you are in purpose, when you are alone, it is rejuvenating because I've been pouring out. I think the question we need to ask ourselves is what are we pouring out? Our peace, our joy, our contentment to the wrong people, our hearts to the wrong people. And we have to get to a place where we understand, are you really surrounded by people who are draining you? Or did you keep handing out straws and allowing them to drain the life out of you? Where are you pouring? When you're in purpose and you're alone, that's rejuvenating. When you're out of purpose and alone, it's aggravating. This is so powerful, y'all. Alone and lonely are not the same thing. When you're alone, you have learned how to play your solo. When you're lonely, you won't even play your solo because you want to duet. I'm going to give you a few reasons on why loneliness arrives in our life. But before I do, I want you to also consider, could you be so lonely because you let your gifts hibernate? Whatever your gift it is, whatever your gift is, singing, acting, business, could you be so lonely because your gifts are hibernating? You're bored because your gifts are collecting dust. A few reasons on why I think loneliness happens and the causes of loneliness. Number one, childhood. Childhood. An upbringing many times has a lot to do with the person feeling like they're always lonely. Like if I grew up in a house where there was really no love there and, and the household that I was in, I had a critical parent. Many times that causes for, that causes for me to avoid intimacy and take the road of a loner. This is, this is something I'm not used to. So somebody trying to hang with you or love on you, it feels awkward because this is not my experience while I was growing up. And so now as I'm an adult and I feel this feeling, something in me died in childhood and I'm trying to resurrect it in adulthood. And truthfully, some of us need space for my family. Just like I've said so many times, you don't have to get wet from a storm that's not yours. And just because we share the same blood does not mean we have to share the same problem. Sometimes space from our family is needed. And unhealthy people think that you're holding a grudge, but that's not a grudge. That's a boundary. This is unhealthy for my heart. And I need to relearn intimacy because I never had it when I was growing up. This is a critical component of ministry, creating spaces where we could bond with one another. Not ministry that insults people and stones people. Like when they were about to stone the woman that got caught in the act of adultery, Jesus stopped them. So if there's a ministry that you attend or a small group that you're in and they stone people, Jesus is not in it. First one, childhood. The second cause of loneliness I believe many times it's transition. Transition. You lost a loved one. You moved to a new city for another job. You're a new mother. And you're like, man, can I just get some sleep? Can I use the bathroom on my own? I just, just give me a second. Give mama a second. It's the transition. And I want you to give grace to yourself because you are now walking in unknown territory. And you have to learn what it's like to be unmarried again. You have to learn what it's like to be a new mother. You have to learn what it's like at this new role and this new position. And sometimes we're so hard on ourselves that we immediately 
feel ourselves in the loneliness without giving us grace to learn this new season. Here's some curveballs for you. The third reason on why a lot of us are played by loneliness is self-centeredness. This might mess you up, but loneliness is strengthened and birthed by envy and comparison. They got all this and they got to do that and they got a chance to do this and they had this opportunity and they have that. And they and so now because I'm looking at them, it's causing for me to resent me. I'm so focused on what I don't have. I'm so focused on me that I can't even see what God is doing in my life. Look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. It says casting down. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When those thoughts start to come up, arrest them, cast that down. I'm focused on what God has for me to do right now. When those thoughts happen about a brother or a sister, cast them down, rejoice with them. Rejoice with them. And if it's a struggle, pray. And as God give me the grace to celebrate as they elevate. Because many times we're so focused on what we don't have that we feel our way into loneliness. Fourth one, a serving deficiency. This is for the individual who's like, man, I got everything. I got a car. I got a dog, two of them. I have a job. I have a career. But I, I, I just still feel so lonely. I'm in this big mansion, this nice house. I got all this money in the bank, but I still feel loneliness. This, this hollow feeling of loneliness with being self-absorbed. What if I told you one of the ways to loosen the grip of loneliness was a life of generosity? Who could benefit from my wealth? I got four cars. Who could benefit from it? Who can benefit from my raise? Who can benefit from my holiday bonus? When God blesses me, it's for me to bless you. When God blesses you, it's for you to bless them. Generosity. Give it away. Give it away. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. When God blesses me, it's for me to bless you. When God blesses you, it's for you to bless them. Number five, a cause of loneliness, deliberate sin. Because sin creates a spiritual loneliness. That's why every time you have sex with that person that you're not married to, you feel more lonely afterwards. That's why after you get high with all of your homies, after that high fades, you feel more depressed than you were before you ever start smoking. It's because sin creates a spiritual loneliness. This is why... This is why you feel like this after you stepped out on your husband. This is why you feel like this after you stepped out on your wife. Sin creates a spiritual loneliness. God gave you a good thing. The problem is you kept looking. All right. How do we overcome this? The weapon of thanksgiving. The way I, the way I think determines how I thank. When I think on the goodness of God, it will bleed over into how I begin to thank him. The way I think determines how I thank. And lastly, calling and purpose. Calling and purpose. You remember when I told you I was a freshman and alone having lunch by myself? You know what I was doing? Writing music. You know what I was doing in my car? Writing sermons. I didn't even feel lonely because while I was alone, I was in purpose. Purpose is a fixer. Purpose fixes problems. There's a problem that you have been cosmically created by God to fix. And maybe, just maybe, the reason we feel so lonely is because we haven't discovered in our mind that this is the season where God is cleansing you and preparing you. It's not punishment for anything you have done but this is all about what you must do. So God, would you help us shift our perspective and help us not to label the season of separation as loneliness. God, but this is the season where you're cleansing us for every appetite and craving that we developed in Egypt. 
Give us a heart and a mind, God, to pursue you and to help us to discover our calling. You're not hiding it from us. Ha <laughs> ha, you're not gonna find your purpose. No, I'm not gonna give it to you. Help us pursue you so that you could show us why we're here. What we're passionate about, that's the clue. What makes us upset, that's the clue. Ever since we were children, there's something that you put on the inside of us that we're passionate about. Passion is a compass that shows us what is it that I have been born to do? Because the worst thing we could ever do is waste the gift of life. In Jesus' name, help us to be cured from loneliness. We pray, amen.